I did not see any devotion or bhakti or faith uh, in what was happening uh, in Ayodhya uh, just a, a few days ago. I only saw what in Bengali we would call arombor or, you know, just, uh, you know, an extravaganza, sort of a display, uh, mm. which is the very antithesis of uh, true religious faith. Mm. Initially, uh, I was uh, uh, writing uh, primarily an economic history of the decline and rise of Asia. But mm. in the process of doing the research uh, and also uh, writing, I felt that uh, it probably would be sufficient to let uh, the economic story provide the framing uh, mm. and uh, focus much more on the articulation of different ideas of Asia. Uh, how mm. was the unity of Asia imagined uh, mm. in the period of European imperial uh, domination? Okay. And uh, I decided um, not to uh, take the colonies or the nation states as the units of analysis. Uh, mm. but rather look at Asia as a connected zone. Mm. So I'm looking at, you know, circulation and, uh, you know, competition uh, oh. and not taking the, the borders of colonies and nation states uh, uh, too uh, seriously. Okay. Uh, now, um, just to give you a concrete example, um, mm. you know, I have a chapter uh, on... Uh, how Asia was being imagined during the decade of the 1910s, uh, 100 years ago. Mm. And, uh, you know, one of the sources that I have been using uh, are the travel logs of Binoy Kumar Sharkar. Now, ah. Binoy Sharkar's English writings uh, mm. have been drawn upon by a number of uh, uh, historians of late, but yes. his Bengali writings have been rather neglected. And he wrote huge, you know, 400 plus pages mm. plus uh, accounts uh, of his visit to Japan in 1915. And then his nine months in China in oh. 1915, 1916. And mm. so, um, you know, just yesterday on the 15th of August, uh, mm. I wrote a short Bengali essay which came out in Ananda Bajar Putrika. Okay. on Binay Sharkar's uh, conceptions of both Shamrajyo, empire, and mm. Swaraj, which was mm. uh, his term for republic uh, in yes. his book on China, which was called Bortoman Juge Chin Shamrajyo. Okay. And what is very interesting is that, uh, you know, in a way he is making an argument for a federal India and a federal China as the building blocks of a larger Asian unity more mm. than a hundred years ago. Yes. And it's an argument which goes directly against what we see in the form of tendencies towards, uh, uh, you know, a Han nationalism or a Hindu yes. nationalism in China yes. and India today. Yes. So I was coming to that actually, I'm sure uh, with your pub, uh, active public political life in the background and uh, your scholarship, uh, you you must be uh, paying attention to the coming together of uh, Ram and Bharat Mata lately in India, and uh, and uh, that that's the situation in which we revisit Tagore's religion of man, and we get into those details Tagore provides us of that very. Uh, ideal vision of what religion should be doing with humans. Um, how do you reflect upon this uh, uh, excessive essentialization about divinity in nationalist framework that we have encountered and is continuing even this kind of tricky time of pandemic? Yes, uh, on the on the question of the image of uh, Bharat Mata or Mother India, I have, of course, uh, written, you know, quite a lot. Uh, 
yes, and yes. I have, uh, you know, addressed the uh, the theme of uh, uh, imagining the nation as mother in a number of essays that are part of my book, The Nation as Mother, and right. other visions of nationhood that came out in mm. uh, in in twenty sixteen. Uh, I will just reiterate uh, that uh, you know we we should be uh, accurate. Uh, in um, revisiting, uh, let us say, the controversy about uh, uh, abridging uh, the song uh, Bande Mataram mm -hmm. to be uh, sung uh, in national gatherings, uh, a decision that was taken by the All India Congress Committee in 1937. Mm -hmm. I saw that, uh, you know, one newspaper has quite a garbled account of what happened, uh, mm -hmm. suggesting that... Uh, Sister Nivedita and even Shubhash Chandra Bose uh, had opposed the, the compromise, which is not mm. true. Uh, Nivedita died in 1911 and couldn't have taken a position one way mm. or the other in 1937. And mm. it was Shubhash Chandra Bose uh, who suggested uh, to Nehru that Rabindranath Tagore's uh, uh, suggestion, advice should be taken on the matter. And mm -hmm. Tagore gave a very balanced opinion, uh, mm -hmm. saying that uh, in national gatherings, it's only the first part of the song Bande Mataram that is appropriate uh, to mm -hmm. be, you know, performed. Uh, mm -hmm. But he also acknowledged that, you know, with the slogan Bande Mataram on their lips, there were mm -hmm. many martyrs who had sacrificed their lives. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, there has to be a respect uh, for that sacrificial patriotism associated with the slogan, uh, Bande Mataram, but we have to have good sense, we have to have inclusiveness, and therefore mm. uh, it is only appropriate that only the first part, which is a celebration of the natural splendor of the country that should be performed. Uh, I mm. see that the wire has a more or less accurate uh, account of how Janagano Mono became the national anthem. Uh, you know, rather than uh, uh, Bande Mataram. Mm -hmm. Now, on the question of the Ram Mandir, I'm sure that it is on uh, your mind and on the minds of those who uh, uh, are at the, uh, the, the South Asia uh, the University. Mm -hmm. You know, the day that uh, this uh, uh, foundation-laying uh, extravaganza was being held in Ayodhya, I was... Uh, looking at my mother, Krishna Bose's uh, book, An Outsider in Politics, uh, I sadly lost my revered mother on the 22nd of February this, this year. But I, you know, read uh, the excerpts of a speech that she includes in her book on Ayodhya in a debate in the Lok Sabha in uh, 2003. And she is saying very clearly uh, that... Um, uh, that uh, and she's speaking as a as a hindu saying that ram will not reside there in a temple which is built uh, on the basis of such hatred and such uh, violence and she's mm -hmm. also quoting you know vivekananda where he says that he will go to the mosque he will kneel in the church uh, he's mm -hmm. also prepared to go to the temple so i think what we should remember is that you know, there was a certain uh, sense of uh, humanistic religion yes. or uh, religiously uh, informed universalism, yes. uh, which, you know, a Tagore believed in, uh, a Vivekananda in a somewhat different way. And so we, uh, and this is something that I've been arguing for some time, that we ought not to see religion as the enemy of the nation. Exactly. Uh, that we need to make a distinction between religious sensibility and uh, right. religious bigotry. Exactly. It is the latter that we must oppose because mm -hmm. uh, most people in our country have deep religious faith of one sort or another, uh, which uh, ought to be True. respected. True. But I did not see any devotion or bhakti or faith uh, in what was happening uh, in Ayodhya uh, just a, a few days ago. I only saw what in Bengali we would call arombor or, you know, just, uh, you know, an extravaganza, sort of a display, uh, mm -hmm. which is the very antithesis of uh, true religious faith. 
And I do talk about Tagore's interpretation of the Ramayana in mm. my uh, forthcoming uh, Asia book. Now, uh, uh, many of you know that uh, you know Tagore um, wrote letters which came out as a book titled Java Jatri Potro, mm. um, Letters of a Traveler to Java uh, in yeah. 1927. And in that book, uh, you find uh, a wonderful environmental interpretation of both the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. Uh, mm. And he's talking about how the tension between the forests and the agricultural plains, um, you know, gets to be played out uh, mm. in, these, uh, uh, in, in these epics. He talks about marriage as metaphor, uh, marriages which seem to be, uh, you know, contrary to what would you would find in the in the law books in both no. of uh, these uh, uh, epics. Mm. So that's one. And but also it's fascinating to see that he's saying that the versions of the Ramayana that he's encountering in Southeast Asia, mm. uh, even in predominantly Muslim Java, yeah. are as original mm. as any of the versions that you might have found in India. Mm. And he's saying that there needs to be more, you know, comparative uh, study, uh, mm. you know, of the epics. And he even wryly comments that one day some German scholar will do this work. And mm. then after citing that work, we will earn PhDs in the university. Mm. Um, so uh, I think that, you know, growing up in Bengal, uh, we have always seen uh, these epics as literature. Uh, right. And uh, we have to understand that not everywhere, uh, you know, is, is Ram regarded as a divinity. And, you know, this attempt to uh, fuse a particular version mm. of religion, which actually does not even appeal to, you know, all Hindus right. uh, with... Uh, the the project of majoritarian nationalism, uh, mm. I think, is you know very short sighted, you know, very counterproductive, mm. and we really need to offer an alternative vision of India, uh, mm. an India which uh, respects the cultural distinctiveness of all of its re regional peoples, its different re religious communities. And the unity of India has only worked uh, when it has been based on what in modern terms might be called the federal principle. Mm. And again, I believe that it's only a federal India that can then truly build uh, a, a South Asia, uh, which is at uh, peace with itself. Uh, mm. And this is how with the building blocks of regions, you know, it, you know, India, South Asia, Asia, that mm. that we can uh, really look forward uh, to a to a global arrangement based mm. on a, a genuine sense of uh, humanity. Yes, yes. Now, uh, I'm talking to people and I get to hear all sorts of uh, age old uh, uh, common sense. And that common sense has unfortunately become part of mainstream discourse, even juridical discourse, and therefore the Supreme Court judgment uh, about the uh, temple and all. And the common sense is that uh, for a very long time, there has been uh, dominance of, in history, there was dominance of Muslim rulers. In post-independent India, it was a particular variety of uh, secularism which uh, denied uh, the significance of religion or religious denominations. And hence, as people are saying, I'm just uh, sharing with you what I have heard from some quarters, which is accessible to me. Uh, uh, and uh, they say that this is the time now for Hindus to impose their will. And this is their will. And they are thankful to the power to be for executing this repressed will of the Hindus. Now, uh, 
this is the kind of common sense which we have heard even before, but it was not this strong. This common sense sense has become this kind of a grudged uh, uh, feeling of certain kind of people. It has become now a mainstream discourse. It's also part. It's also validated by juridical discourse. And in that kind of situation, it becomes slightly difficult to retrieve this. Uh, I mean, this tradition of syncretism and the tradition of universal humanism that we have uh, been familiar with through our thinkers. So, how to handle yes. this kind of challenge? You know, but this is really, uh, to a very large extent, a a, a function of state power, uh, yes. and. Um, um, you know, this is a very uh, peculiar uh, reading of popular sovereignty that we uh, hear about uh, these days, what you're calling sort of a certain commonsensical discourse that yeah. seems to have gained ground. Uh, but we have to remember that it has uh, advanced uh, since 2014 uh, mm. with uh, a party and a political formation explicitly committed to religious majoritarianism as the mm. basis of Indian uh, uh, nationalism. And of course, uh, it has, you know, infiltrated uh, most of the state institutions. Uh, that is why you see it reflected even in the juridical discourse as, uh, as, as you uh, just, uh, uh, just mentioned. Mm. Um, now, I think this is something that needs to be called into question. And I think there are sufficient intellectual and cultural resources mm. uh, in India uh, on mm. the basis of which uh, this uh, might be done uh, and, uh, and achieved. Mm. For one thing, uh, I don't think that there was ever any Muslim domination. Uh, yes. You know, this uh, talk about 1000 years of servitude yeah. is a completely false claim, which yeah. even the Prime Minister uh, has taken to repeating in many of his uh, speeches. Right. Um, now, if you if you look at um, the analysis of those who, in a sense, were even true Hindus, mm. uh, take the example of Aurobindo Ghosh, Sri Aurobindo. Yes. Yes. He refers yes. to the Mughal Empire as a magnificent construction, mm -hmm. more liberal in point of religion uh, mm -hmm. than any other contemporary European uh, mm -hmm. state. Right. Now, the problem with our uh, secularists uh, uh -huh. was that they became a little too narrow. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, unfortunately, Nehruvian secularism, mm -hmm. uh, and also I might add, uh, mm. The control of the Indian National Congress uh, mm. by, you know, one dynasty, the Nehru Gandhi dynasty, mm. meant that a whole galaxy of political leaders and thinkers and intellectuals mm. were sidelined uh, mm. in the national discourse. Mm. And that is what made it easier for, uh, 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 for those who represent uh, Hindu majoritarianism to appropriate you know, so many uh, of the, you know, major intellectual and political figures uh, mm. of the late 19th and the first half of the 20th century. Mm. So we need to reclaim them. Mm. And I just mentioned, uh, you know, Binay Kumar Sharkar at the start of our conversation. Mm. And one of the things that he's saying in his book on Bhattoman Juge Chin Shamrajyo, the Chinese Empire in the present age, mm. is that... Uh, the Republicans in China, mm. uh, he's suggesting, is mm. making a grave historical error mm. by painting the Qing dynasty as mm. foreign. Be and he's saying that uh, any historical exploration suggests that they were not. Mm. Um, uh, and uh, this is a matter of very narrow, short-term political expediency. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, he's arguing that the Mughal Empire was never foreign. That, mm. you know, first of all, it became fully Indian and mm. it included uh, in its uh, ruling structures 
people mm. de- belonging to all manner of different religious affiliations. Now, this is not to say that in order to display a political power uh, mm. in the uh, medieval or early modern times, there weren't often uh, assaults on places of worship. But by mm. the same token, in order to win legitimacy, there was mm. patronage of places mm. of religious worship, of mm. those who uh, followed religions that were uh, not the religion of the sovereign of the day. Mm. Now, this mm. is quite remarkable in India because, um, you know, just, you know, think about the, the Mughals uh, attracting people from all different religious faiths, even mm. in the 16th, 17th centuries, when in, let's say, England, uh, until the 19th century, you could not hold high political or civil office if you mm. did not subscribe to the religion of the sovereign. Right, right. You know, so if, if you actually, you know, compare, you know, our states, uh, empires with contemporary uh, states mm. and kingdoms mm. elsewhere in the world, they were much more broad, broad-minded. Uh, mm. You know, so I, 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 that's why I think lessons of history uh, yeah. imparted uh, in clear, simple ways may ge- go a long way uh, towards uh, restoring the perspective, changing mm. the commonsensical views that you're talking about. And mm. here I feel that um, academic historians must begin to think in new ways that, of course, we will be writing our scholarly books, which will mm. be read by other scholars. Right. But I think it is incumbent on many of us who are able to do so to mm. write for larger readerships. Right. And you mentioned my public role. Uh, the, the reason, you know, my primary identity is that of a historian and scholar. But I decided to go and uh, uh, be a member of parliament in the 16th Lok Sabha because mm. I felt that, uh, you know, we, we must, you know, take time out uh, and leave the, uh, uh, the ivory tower uh, yeah. and actually contribute to the, to the public discourse because mm-hmm. that's the need of the hour. And even mm-hmm. though I'm now back at Harvard and I did not contest the last parliamentary elections, that mm-hmm. does not mean that I don't remain fully active in public life. And mm-hmm. I hope that many other academics will also see the, the, the need uh, to be uh, visible in the, mm-hmm. in the public domain and mm-hmm. contribute uh, mm-hmm. to changing what is becoming a, a very narrow and you know, bigoted discourse right. about the nation. About that, I wanted to ask a little more. I mean, thank you that you mentioned this. Uh, I wanted to ask, how was it uh, to balance uh, intellectual urges of a scholar sitting in a house which had all sorts of discussion? And I'm sure you had colleagues who might not be able or may not be interested to uh, understand you. Um, What, I mean, how did you balance this? What was the point of reconciliation? As a, as a... Well, actually, my scholarly colleagues uh, were, 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 were quite supportive. And uh, they actually heard uh, several of the speeches that I uh, gave in Parliament. Mm. And uh, I think uh, I was able to convince them uh, that, uh, you know, the Lok Sabha was for me a classroom with a difference. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, even though, uh, you know, I'm not active on social media, uh, what happened was that uh, 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 these, you know, speeches almost became uh, lectures that I was giving uh, in a, you know, massive uh, mm. online uh, course. Mm. And, uh, you know, these speeches, whether the one that I gave at the time of the crisis in the universities in yes. February of 2016, yes. you know, not to mention my you know, first speech in June 2014, or yes. then uh, the debate uh, on uh, the 75th anniversary of the Quit India movement yes. in August 2017. Yes. Uh, these were in some ways history lessons that I was providing. 
And mm. I think, um, you know, they reached a, a, a very wide cross section uh, mm. of the, uh, you know, younger generation. Uh, yes. I know that when I was speaking in the debate on Bangladesh on the land boundary agreement, mm. uh, it was, you know, being heard live even in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so I think that, uh, I, I think that my colleagues were actually very understanding of of the role that I was playing in the face of the of the rise of right wing authoritarianism the world over. And mm. here in the United States, of course, um, once Trump came to power in 2016, uh, mm. people understood even more why <laughs> I decided in 2014 uh, mm. to contest uh, mm. the, uh, uh, the rise of uh, right wing authoritarianism uh, right. In, uh, in India, mm. uh, because, uh, you know, all of the very uh, narrow minded uh, uh, political discourse on immigration mm. was heard during the campaign of 2014 in India, mm. at mm. least two years before one began to hear echoes of the same kind of language uh, right. during Trump's campaign in 2016. Uh, mm. So I think that uh, since um, in some ways what we are seeing in uh, South Asia is a, is a global phenomenon, uh, right. And you see the rise of different kinds of authoritarianism, whether in the United mm. States or in Brazil uh, mm. and elsewhere in several countries of Europe. Uh, mm. You know, uh, uh, people understand that uh, scholars and academics have a public role to play. Yeah, but I was basically uh, curious about your colleagues in the parliament. How were they taking you? That is far more... <laughs> interesting <laughs> well uh, i have to say that uh, um, I, uh, I i received a you know a great deal of uh, respect uh, right. from uh, my colleagues mm -hmm. and as you know in uh, parliament uh, uh, there is often a commotion going on exactly. uh, and there is a there is a lot of interruption mm -hmm. but as the years went on Mm. I found that I was the the least interrupted, as it were, uh, okay. of uh, of the speakers, mm. and uh, even those who were sitting in the treasury benches mm. who did not agree with me uh, would would often listen. Uh, mm. Sometimes they would stand up and try to obstruct, but. Uh, you know, by and large, I felt that um, because I never engaged in personal attacks, but oh. talked about uh, principles, mm -hmm. um, uh, I also did not give very much of an opportunity uh, mm -hmm. for the, you know, kind of uh, disruption uh, that we, you know, typically uh, mm -hmm. uh, saw uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the Lok Sabha. Uh, but as I said, uh, when I was speaking in the Lok Sabha, I wasn't, my audience was not limited uh, mm. to my colleagues uh, in Parliament. Uh, right. They were the ones present in person. Uh, but uh, in some ways, the audience was much larger uh, mm. with, uh, with live telecasts. And then immediately, of course, it would be on YouTube you know, the same yeah. day and, mm. you know, large numbers of people across India and even beyond uh, mm. would would listen to what I have had to say. Mm. So which means the uh, wise academics like yourself, there should be many more in that uh, house of commotion and uh, <laughs> they would hopefully be able to maintain sanity and offer new kind of role, role models. Uh, which may be becoming uh, fewer and fewer as the as we uh, go ahead in time. Uh, I wanted to come back to another point which you raised uh, uh, and very valid point about what historians ought to be doing and what kind of history and their historians offering to the large world at large uh, some kind of public history through popular writings. And that reminds me of your engagement with Indian Ocean during the time 
of tsunami and uh, looking at tsunami uh, that while reading that book one felt that you know see along indian ocean uh, there is so much of interconnections and uh, calamities and pandemic are those situations when one begins to see those interconnections uh, they become more far more palpable and unavoidable uh, did you also uh, return to that idea of south asia that interconnected south asia irrespective of the borders and boundaries uh, during this pandemic because as i was telling you right in the beginning the level of emotion across the region was very high and the melancholia and pathos about people suffering uh, particularly migrant workers beat in bangladesh pakistan sri lanka uh, india for sure became a hot spot of all those migrant workers cluelessly roaming about and many of them for miles and miles they would walk on foot and many of them died on the way and some of them could manage to reach many cases of suicide and strange kind of deaths uh, disturbing our ideas anthropology old anthropological notion of death and dying so uh, did you think of revisiting south asia i understand you are preoccupied with uh, the idea of asia uh, uh, due to your uh, manuscript but uh, just like during the tsunami you revisited you visited this idea of you know uh, uh, yes well uh, you know of course um, um, uh, when i was um, doing my research for a uh, hundred horizons you know the indian ocean in the age of global empire yes. um, you know the tsunami happened um, you know as, as i was completing the research and it was a very powerful uh, reminder of the interconnectedness of the entire mm. indian ocean uh, interregional arena that is why mm. i opened the book uh, mm. with uh, the tsunami and earthquake uh, in the indonesian archipelago then mm. setting off these huge waves that then reach uh, the shores of east africa in a matter of a few hours but you will find that in the book i also wrote about uh, you know disease and you know there is a a, ch a chapter on uh, the pilgrims progress under yeah. colonial yeah. rules on the right. the hajj and pilgrimages across uh, the indian ocean and you know the quarantine for example on the kamran island and so on figured mm -hmm. you know quite a bit um, yes. you know there was the cholera epidemic of 1865 and then the plague epidemics of the 1890s Uh, for a number of decades from the 1890s all the way to the mid 1920s calcutta port was closed to pilgrim traffic because mm. of uh, epidemic uh, disease mm. uh, so yes and in some ways uh, uh, i i of course continue to be interested in south asia because i keep telling people who ask me that is your interregional arena only oceanic or can it be you know based on overland connections and the answer mm. is of course both it mm. so happens that i was writing a book on the indian ocean and therefore i described the indian ocean as an interregional arena but mm. there are many overland connections as well but mm. what happened with the migrant laborers in some ways took me back to my even earlier work uh, mm. on on the peasantry because mm. you know there was a time when i wrote quite a bit on agrarian history and some of my earliest work was yes. on the impact of the great depression of the mm -hmm. 1930s mm -hmm. on agrarian economy uh, and society and politics in uh, in in south asia mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and it was you know heartbreaking to see uh, how the state's response uh, right. certainly in india mm -hmm. uh, took no account Uh, mm -hmm. of uh, you know more than 100 million uh, you know migrant uh, workers right. and it has been so badly mismanaged in india you mm -hmm. know giving a three and a half hour notice uh, before uh, in, uh, uh, launching a nationwide uh, lockdown yes. um, you know without making any arrangements for these migrant laborers being thrown out of work being provided mm -hmm. being provided proper housing or food it could mm. easily have been done with schools and colleges closed 
one could mm. have uh, housed them, could have fed them, could have given them money, but none mm. of that was done. And then, uh, you know, exactly at the wrong moment, uh, mm. in the mid to uh, late uh, May, you mm. know, when in fact, uh, you know, in late March, there were very few uh, cases. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, as the number of cases were rising exactly at the wrong moment, there yes. was this decision to send back the migrant laborers to the places uh, mm. where they had come from, and again, increasing uh, the infections in those areas. So, mm. you know, it's almost as if these migrant workers in the informal sector do mm. not have the rights of full citizens looks like in our countries of uh, of of south asia mm. and uh and and this is you know uh distressing you know to the to the extreme mm. um and the problem of course is that there are huge challenges mm. in organizing migrant laborers as a political force right. and uh, that's partly to do with their vulnerability, their mm. economic vulnerability. Mm. Uh, but it's also partly to do with the very nature of, uh, of, of mig migration. Mm. Now, this is not to say that, you know, they have not, uh, migrant laborers haven't contributed to, you know, politics before. Mm. If you think about the 1930s, mm. what happened was that uh, not just within South Asia, but across the Indian Ocean, there had been, you know, migrant laborers uh, going to different destinations. Some of them were indentured laborers, most right. of whom went to Mauritius, for example, from right. the 1830s onwards. Mm. Then there were sort of semi-indentured laborers. There were mm. large numbers of Tamil laborers who went to work on the rubber plantations of Malaya or the tea mm. plantations of Ceylon. Mm. And what happened during the Depression uh, mm. was that they were thrown out of work. Mm. And some of them, not all, uh, had mm. to return to their old, densely populated agrarian zones, complicating mm. the problems in those areas mm. from which there had been this kind of an escape hatch of migration in the decades that preceded mm. the onset of the, uh, of the Depression. Mm. Uh, so it's in the early 1930s that the demographic flows of the previous mm. six decades were mm. either arrested or reversed. Or think mm. even of the Chinese laborers who worked in the tin mines of Malaya. Mm. Some of them tried to go back, but China was a very uh, troubled place at that time. Mm. So mm. many could not. So what did they do? Uh, they became squatters on government mm. reserved land and became the first recruits to the Malayan Communist Party, for example. So, you know, any large scale economic crisis mm. uh, always has social and political consequences, mm. not all of which may be quite evident at the moment. Um, because, you know, as you said, uh, there is such a, a deep sense of melancholia, yes. as you know, people are, are dying, um, mm. or, the, or there are high rates of morbidity. And this is a particularly bad kind of a disease, because it seems to affect uh, different individuals in different ways. We yeah. cannot be sure who will get a mild form of the disease, uh, yeah. who will actually, you know, suffer gravely mm. and uh, uh, die. Mm. Uh, and uh, so it's, uh, you know, and people are saying that in some ways uh, the virus does not uh, distinguish uh, between rich and poor in terms of infection that is to some degree true but mm. not entirely because mm. uh, it's the poor who live uh, huddled in closed space closed spaces right. who right. are much more uh, prone to getting mm. this uh, disease and what's more uh, they are likely to get uh, you know uh, far less in terms of proper uh, medical treatment mm. And as in the case of famines mm. uh, or other disasters, mm. um, it's the poor and the vulnerable who suffer much more. And we, we have to understand that 
uh, even this virus, which in some ways doesn't distinguish, uh, mm. is aggravating inequality, which had right. already reached uh, very troubling proportions in mm. our age of neo you know neoliberal uh, globalization, and mm. therefore. Uh, an ethical politics of the time uh, mm. would, in fact, emphasize what in a South Asian languages we might call samya, which is equality. You know, yeah. that is what needs to be uh, the mantra for these times, that we must strive for mm. uh, you know, equality in these very uh, troubling times. Mm. So then you're right, and, and, and in that light, one should uh, anticipate emergence of alternate, alternative models of politicking across the region. Otherwise, the same old uh, way of politics is, is just inhuman in this kind of situation. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Irrespective of the national territorial uh, boundary and uh, the identity, Irrespective of that, one has to think of um, different kind of models to be tried out. Because I think the basic human dignity right. is getting lost in right. you know the uh, in the politics uh, of you know majoritarianism of hatred uh, mm. that we but that we see you know mm. sp spawning. Mm. And in that context, I wanted to hear from you whether one can construct novel utopias, different kind of utopias, looking at history of South Asia. Because uh, that's another issue. Uh, whenever we say South Asia, there is this uh, bureaucratic version of South Asia, which becomes uh, more dominant in our mind. Uh, even academic deliberations, be it in international relations studies or some of these area studies, uh, is that, uh, um, say, for example, Sark uh, notion of South Asia becomes far more uh, 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 important than than people's contact in South Asia or or elsewhere. Uh, scholars have argued about civilizational contacts uh, in South Asia, and likewise, political contacts in South Asia, political contacts of various kind of non-state political actors. Uh, I'm just. Uh, uh, rambling about various kinds of kinds of possibilities, but could one think of creating novel utopias looking at history? Uh, well, you and your faculty colleagues at the South Asia University will be able to address that question in a much better way uh, than than I can, because uh, all of you have actually put together a, a book on hmm. uh, you know uh, South Asia as uh, as utopia. Uh, yes, what, what I will say is that, um, you know, we, we have to uh, move away from this uh, sense uh, of, the, of the nation state as mm. God. Um, right. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, even efforts at solidarity across Asia and Africa, mm. uh, or certainly trying to build bridges across the different uh, nation states of South Asia mm. have not been able to uh, cross borders in right. creative ways. Mm. Now, history is very important here because mm. uh, in the course of our various struggles for freedom, mm. all the way up to the mid 20th century, uh, if you look at the basic trends in anti-colonial political thought, uh, they were in fact, in a sense, you know, humanistic. Uh, they were talking about movements uh, mm. that were not bounded by territory. I mean, right. there were both territorial and extraterritorial, or, or shall we say, universalistic, or perhaps mm. even utopian, you know, mm. conceptions of anti-colonialism. You mm. know, what should replace uh, the uh, 
uh, system of, uh, you know, colonial states that had been imposed on South Asia and also other parts of Asia and, uh, and Africa. Mm. Now, one of the problems was that at the end of the First World War, as most of the remaining empires unraveled, uh, the nation state came to be privileged uh, under right. the rubric of the, of the League of Nations. Mm. And unfortunately, instead of promoting international understanding, mm. uh, what it did much more was to create barriers uh, between existing as well as uh, incipient or aspiring mm. nation states. Right. But that vision was always challenged, uh, mm. for example, by Rabindranath Tagore. Yes. Uh, now, uh, so uh, I think we need to recover uh, mm. from our more enlightened political thought mm. of the you know, early 20th century, elements which did not simply you know, flow into this uh, uh, structure of mm. uh, independent uh, you know, post-colonial uh, mm. uh, nation states. Uh, I think that uh, we ended up borrowing a little too much from <laughs> imperialist understandings mm. of nation states. In right. Europe, they built nation states. The heyday of the nation states lasted mm. from about 1860 uh, mm. to perhaps the mid 20th century. But we forgot how to draw on the best of our own political thought. Right. Instead, you know, it, in Europe, at least, they had the nation state. Uh, mm. In South Asia, what happened uh, post the 1857 rebellion, mm. we basically took from Britain and from Europe the conception of the colonial state. Mm. And then, you know, the nation states became successors of the colonial states uh, right. imposed by European empires. I don't see why we should privilege those forms. You know, why can't we draw uh, on, on, on the best thought of some of, you know, uh, right. what is our own political tradition uh, mm. to think in different ways? That's the only way that we might be able to genuinely uh, mm. uh, uh, create uh, connections and, and solidarity across South Asia and beyond. Right, right. So there are plenty of things to talk with you, I'm sure there would be endless atta <laughs> if one uh, does not uh, resist temptation. Before I really uh, uh, draw closure temporarily uh, of this conversation, uh, I would, I was, I'm usually curious about uh, uh, scholars interest in things which are not related to really uh, uh, deep scholarship. <laughs> Uh, so what do you do when you are not doing history and when you're not wondering about the world? I have a feeling you are deeply interested in uh, Ravindra Shangit. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, you know, other than, you know, reading and writing, uh, mm -hmm. what has uh, uh, sustained me uh, during these long months of mostly, you know, home internment because of the pandemic, yeah. Uh, has been uh, listening to a, a lot of uh, music mm -hmm. and uh, you know I've lit I, I, you know I'm quite eclectic in my uh, mm -hmm. musical interests but of course uh, the songs of Tagore have been you know very much uh, a, a part of that uh, uh, repertoire mm -hmm. uh, but even when it comes to uh, Bengali composers there mm -hmm. are others who appeal to me of that same period including the General Al Roy and uh -huh. uh, uh, Utul Prashad Sen and of course Kazi Nozrul Islam. Uh, so these are the Bengali composers of the uh, you know uh, early 20th century uh, who I have been uh, listening to you know uh, quite a bit. Um, uh, unfortunately the Boston Symphony is closed but they are actually uh, have been putting out on their website uh, uh -huh. old recordings so i have also been listening to quite a bit of uh, uh right. european uh, uh 
uh, classical music. So uh, yes, m music is something that has uh, sustained me. And as you know, I've also uh, actually done some recordings of Tagore's songs uh, and uh, translated some of Tagore into uh, yeah. in, into English. Yeah. Uh, and uh, some of this is available even on my website, sugatobos.com, as uh -huh. uh, Amar Rabindranath, uh, uh -huh. my Tagore. Uh, uh -huh. You know, there are 10 of my most favorite songs of Tagore. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I first give the English translation so that people who don't follow Bengali can understand uh, mm -hmm. the, the words. And then I sort of perform uh, that, uh, the, uh, that song. Mm -hmm. so thanks a lot. Uh, 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 this is uh, such a wonderful experience. It's always nice interacting with you. It's a great pleasure. So yes, let us hope for better times when we can uh, meet in person. But for yes. now, uh, let us use uh, uh, what technology offers us in order to, yes. you know, be in touch.